know about drizzling. So uh, it's being recorded, so uh, we'll have this for all posterity. So Alex, if you would like to uh, go ahead and share your screen, you've got the floor. I will do that. Let's see here now, back to this. Okay, um, so I'll go to slideshow, I guess. Can you see it? That's Over good. There. Yep. Okay, good. So what I'm going to talk about today is a process called drizzling, and uh, I'm going to talk about what it is, when it will help, and when it will not, because it's used probably far more often than where it's really applicable. And while it doesn't do any harm to, to use it when it will do no good for you, it does do a little bit of damage in that it takes up a lot of disk space with a, a big image and it can take many hours to drizzle things of computer time. So that's one of the uh, downsides. Okay, so what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about what is drizzle, at least applied to astro images. Why is drizzle applied to astro images? What is it we want to accomplish? And when is it helpful? And when is it useless? And finally, what things do you need in your images to be set up to do drill, drizzling properly? And then something about how it actually works internally, because I've noticed on the internet, some uh, individuals misstate what it's doing, and it's no use leaving that. Okay, why drizzle? There's only one reason to drizzle, and that's to improve the resolution of your images. Now, as far as I can tell, uh, I, I drizzle sometimes and I don't drizzle other times. And really, I see very little dis difference, even when uh, it is warranted to give it a try. And I think the reason is, is that it's actually adding detail at what was your original sub-pixel level. So if you zoom in far enough to see your pixels and then you uh, drizzle, you'll see more detail at that level, but most of us probably never, never uh, zoom in that far. Um, astronomers, professional astronomers do it because they have images that have amazing detail. If you're looking at the Hubble Space Telescope, they have no atmosphere to blur things and cause trouble. They have the ability to resolve things at smaller than their pixel size uh, that they have in their camera. And that's why they do it. Uh, if your images are amazingly detailed, then there's a good chance they're going to benefit from um, drizzling. However, if you have a low fuzzy, low resolution fuzzy image and you drizzle it, you get a high resolution fuzzy image looking just like the original one and it won't accomplish anything. The criteria for when you drizzle is something called undersampling. When you undersample a scene, then you can use drizzle to advantage. Uh, some drizzlers believe that drizzling uh, reduces noise in their images. So they even drizzle one-to-one. -one. That is, they make a drizzled image with exactly the same resolution as their beginning image. That doesn't do any good. It doesn't really reduce noise. What it does is trick your algorithms into thinking you have less noise because it doesn't detect the noise at a pixel level that, I'm sorry, it detects noise at a pixel level uh, is what the algorithms do, but you've actually made correlated noise, correlated among pixels, and it doesn't know how to handle that, and it just ignores it and say, look, your image has got less noise in them, but they don't. They just have a different kind of noise. Okay, the requirements to dither is you need a subset of images. You need a bunch of subs. How many? That depends on how aggressively you're going to change your resolution. If you use PixInsight, uh, PixInsight gives you a chance to double the resolution, quadruple, and so on. So if you double the, the resolution, that means that you have a picture that has four times as many pixels in it. And uh, that can be a, a bit of a problem if, if you have limited disk space. 
Um, let's see, what else I say? Uh, you have to be under sampling, as we've just said, and I'll explain what under sampling is. If you don't have under sampling, uh, you're up a creek without a paddle. It's, drizzling isn't going to do anything for you. Drizzling takes a lot of computer resources, not only disk space. Uh, I have an i9 machine uh, with 18 coprocessors and uh, a high-end video card. And for me, <clears throat> excuse me, for me to drizzle 15 images, let's say I had 15 subs of red and I wanted to make a, a drizzled image at a factor of two, it would take about 40 minutes, 20 to 40 minutes to drizzle just the red. If you had 100 images or, or something like that you were dealing with, and even on a high-end machine, you're probably gonna take hours just to desert, desert just to drizzle one of the channels. So uh, it's an expensive activity. Um, of course, you could start the drizzle and go to bed and that'd be fine. Uh, here's an example of what dithering can do and when what undersampling is. On the right, over, let's see, right here, you see something called a moray pattern. This is just a brick wall, but the, the bricks are uh, undersampled. There's not enough, the pixel size isn't capturing individual bricks, so it's missampling it and thinking that the bricks have some other shape and size than they really do. Now, if we took a whole bunch of images like this that were dithered, that means shifted slightly between images, a fraction of a pixel, then we could reconstruct what the brick wall actually looks like. So one of the indications that dithering is warranted would be moray patterns in your, uh, in your uh, images, but you usually don't see that because our images are just too complex stars and everything in them to see that. So what drizzle is, it's a mathematical way to take a set of undersampled images, subs, and improve them, their stack resolution above that visible in any sub. So if you took a sub and a properly drizzled frame, and you put them side by side, there'd be more detail in the drizzled frame than you could recognize in any one of the single subs. The Hubble team developed this technology and deter, uh, coined the term drizzle. Uh, there are a lot of programs out there, not a lot, a few programs out there that can do the drizzling for you. PixInsight is one, uh, and there are some free ones. I think some of these stacking programs can do it too. I do it in PixInsight when I try, when I try to do it. Um, drizzle's underpinning. Well, I've heard Drizzle described as, quote, the program guesses at a value between two pixels. Uh, there's no guessing involved. It's not a random number generated and put in between two pixels. Others say that it's an interpolation between pixels. That is, maybe like the average value of two pixels, set the average value in between, and that's wrong too. It's not interpolating anything. It's a rigorous mathematical tool that adds pixels that have true information to your image. The information was in your image, you just couldn't, or in your set of images, you just couldn't see it in any one image, and this is a way to extract it. And so it sounds very valuable. By the way, if you have a question, go ahead and interrupt me, uh, or save it to the end, either one. Uh, there are two things that constrain whether you can drizzle or not, actually three. Uh, the first is the, the rally criterion, which we also call Dahl's limit. And that has to do with how close together two stars can be. And you can still separate the, them when you look at the stars visually. And that visual part is important because cameras have pixels. Your eyes uh, don't really have pixels. So you get more resolution in your eye than you would may, you may get more resolution in your eye than you do in your camera. But anyway, we, it's defined as a visual observation and it depends on the diameter the aperture of your telescope. The second thing is scene conditions, atmospheric turbulence. It blurs the scene and limits the resolution. That is the amount of small detail that you can get. And again, that can be assessed visually. You can get an idea of the uh, image quality or visual image quality that you have. It's not the same as it's going to be in a photograph. 
in the following sense. If I look through a telescope, I can see that star shimmering around. I look at the right kinds of stars, the right doubles and things like that. I can make an estimate of how much blur there is being caused by the atmosphere. If I take a picture of it, there's no way to extract the uh, blur caused by the atmosphere for our small telescopes from either dust and uh, things like the spider, the uh, diagonal mirror holder, dust, and other things in your optics, and the limit, Dahl's limit of your optics, and to extract from that the actual seeing conditions. It's all compounded together, convolved together. And boy, it'd be real nice for me to know how to get the scene out because then I could say for sure which images are worth uh, dithering and which are not, not dithering, which ones are worth drizzling or not. Okay, but with a camera, drizzle only helps if your pixel size exceeds the visual resolution limit limited by seeing with the, and with the Wiley car, uh, criterion and spiders and dust and other things that are in the way of your viewing. And then after you can't determine all of those, which you can't, uh, at least you can't separate them, you get the, the convolution of the whole things. Uh, there's one thing, more thing that comes into play, and maybe you've heard of it, it's called the Nyquist criterion, and it tells you how many samples you have to have, how many pixels you have to have within one unit of your scene quality. Okay, so let's see what else some of that means. Okay, the Riley criterion is uh, given up here at the top. R is a four and a half divided by the diameter of your objective. And it means if you had two stars, as we do here in the left image, we, they would be just resolved when this criteria is met. We would just see this little dip in between here and say, oh, those two stars, that's not one star. So they're just at, Dahl, at Dahl's limit or at the Riley criterion. Uh, but if your camera had a pixel size that was the size of this whole frame, you'd see one star. You wouldn't see two. So the pixel size and the resolving capability of your telescope are two of the factors that come about or play into whether you should drizzle or not. On the other hand, if we had a grid here of a three by three set of pixels running across it, maybe even more, five by five, then you would be sampling across this area here and you could pick up this decrease in light between them. So smaller pixels would give us a chance to, uh, to see that kind of object. Bigger pixels, we wouldn't see it, but maybe we could use drizzle to recover that information. That's what drizzle does. Okay, I'm not gonna go through any details here, simply to say that the ideal pixel size that just meets the uh, size you would want to get the maximum resolution out of both the Dahl's limit or the Riley criterion and the seeing conditions is a simple equation like this. The pixel size in say microns is proportional to the focal length of your, your uh, telescope. So the more, uh, the larger the focal length of your telescope, the larger the pixel would be. And it's also depending on seeing and or the uh, resolution limit. So it goes up as the resolution limit goes up, the ideal pixel size goes up, or as the Riley criteria goes up, the ideal pixel size goes up. And as I said in previously, the problem is there's no good way to estimate this term from an image. But if you look through your telescope before you took the image, maybe you get an idea. All right, here's some examples. So let's say you have a 35 millimeter Canon camera with a, a two inch F12 lens and seeing is one arc second. We plug into this equation and we find that if our pixels are larger than three quarters of a micron, drizzle will be helpful. And they're almost certainly bigger than that. So if you go out back and start taking pictures of the sky, the Milky Way and what have you with your Canon camera or your Nikon or whatever you use and you have a common kind of lens on it, then drizzling is for you. 
Now, what if you had a four inch F4 telescope and the signal is also one arc second? Well, when you plug into that, it says you could drizzle if your pixels are larger than 1.5 microns. And uh, they probably are, though our latest CMOS chips are getting down to about that size. So it may, you're right on the borderline there if you're using a CMOS chip. Probably it would be good for drizzling. Now let's say you have a 10 inch F9 telescope with a 2X Barlow and the scene is one and a half arc seconds. You plug it into the equation and it says the only time drizzle is going to help you is if your pixel size is greater than 22 microns. I'll bet none of us have 22 micron or larger cameras. So if you had a, a telescope like this with a setup of, of this focal length and a Barlow lens and that thing, uh, drizzling isn't going to get you anything. So basically, uh, smaller telescopes on Earth, amateur telescopes, are more likely to benefit and shorter focal lengths are likely to benefit from drizzling than our large focal length cameras. I mean, large focal length telescopes. Uh, so we need a bunch of subs to do our dizzle, dithering and our drizzling. And uh, generally I would say better than 15, but that depends on how aggressive you're gonna be. If you're going to make things uh, 2X, twice as large, you may get away with 10 frames I'd still go with at least 15. If you're going to try to uh, drizzle something to eight times, then you're probably going to need 40 frames. And 40 frames is probably going to mean that it processes one filter for six hours or so on a high-end computer. The images have to be dithered, or the target has to move in each between each frame. And the dithering can't be integers. You can't just move over one pixel and take the same image again. You can move two and a half, four and 4.3, anything you want. And it has to dither non-integer amounts. And it has to dither for a 2D image like we take. It has to dither in both X and Y. Uh, the observations must satisfy the equations and the conditions we just saw for those example telescopes on the previous page. And in the end, we come down to the conclusion that dithering works best for large scopes in space because there's no atmospheric distortion and are blurring or small scopes or cameras here on Earth. The intermediate ones are somewhat iffy whether it's going to help at all, where I mean an intermediate telescope is maybe a 10 inch telescope. Okay, now let's say we meet those requirements for drizzle. So we have a few, a uh, couple really, of things we have to decide on. That's gonna be, first of all, how aggressive we drizzle. And I've already discussed that this changes the amount of subs we need as well as the uh, time it takes to process it. And there's another parameter called shrinkage value. And the shrinkage value uh, in drizzle, the Hubble people talk about taking one pixel as, and moving it to somewhere else within this new drizzle frame as uh, a, a droplet being moved over. And they shrink this droplet so that it doesn't cover the same space on the new uh, image as it does on the old one, which is why we need a lot of frames, uh, more frames than we might otherwise think. Uh, if you do too much of this droplet as you decrease the droplet, you get more and more resolution in your uh, drizzled frame. But you start to get cause aliasing and you start to have places where there just aren't enough pixels contributing to the new pixel. The old pixels uh, aren't mapped to the new drizzle frame pixels in enough density to work. Okay, so how does drizzling actually work? Let's look at so a simple example. This is the simple one. Uh, let's say we had a signal, and it could be, in this case, let's, if you want, this can be a uh, audio signal. And we have to start with the blue signal. This is the same thing. Uh, we have frequencies in all of our, our uh, images. That's why we can do Fourier analysis of them or uh, other use other tools that rely on the frequencies of the information. So an audio signal is just 
a similar thing, a one-dimensional thing, compared to our two-dimensional uh, frequencies and our images. So if you'll allow me to talk about it in terms of, of this, I can make some sense out of it. So these red dots are where we take our samples. So this might, you might think of this as left to right as time going, going on. So we have here zero seconds and here sometime later. And this sound wave is passing down by us. And so we take a sample of the sound wave, its intensity at this point, we measure the intensity a little later, at this point, a little later, at this point, and so on. And we can connect all of these points and we get this yellow curve, yellow dash curve. And we can see that we've undersampled the image, uh, the sine wave, because we cannot reproduce it. This is the sine wave we reproduce. And it's actually called an alias sine wave because it is not consistent with the data. It's at a different frequency. Now let's say we, we dither our samples. So we have the same sine wave going by, but rather than sampling here, we sample here. And rather than sampling here, we sample here. That's this diagram. So we've shifted everything by uh, three quarters of a cycle. So we now sample every three quarters of a cycle, but it's shifted by one third of a one quarter, one quarter of a cycle. Sorry. Now, if we put these two data sets together, these could be two different images. We now get this tracing of the data. And we're starting to pick up some sharpness, it's for sure, but we haven't reproduced that, that signal. So we dither again. We shift it again one quarter of a cycle. So rather than being at the peak here, we're a quarter cycle later where we have a point, for instance. Now if we had A, B, oops, ha, huh, back. A, B, and C together, this is where the points lie and we've pretty well reproduced the, uh, the uh, original sine wave. And that's what dithering does uh, for us and what, in fact, the sampling all put together is what uh, drizzling does for us. So dithering plus drizzling gives us the higher resolution data. And you notice these aren't just arbitrary interpolations between the data, data points of these two. These are actually consistent with the input signal. Okay, so how does it work on a 1D image? 1D, that is, we just took a line through our, one of the uh, lines through our uh, CCD camera. And let's say we have a signal, these are pixels. So here's one signal, there's another signal, and there's another signal. These are stars, if you want. Uh, but our pixels are very large, so <clears throat> this signal maps into something that looks like this. And we have not resolved the three, the three objects. Here you see there's space between the objects, but our pixels are so big. This is a pixel width here. Our pixels are so big that the objects run together. So we, again, we do that, and here's, here's just the image from the last page. They map, the stars map into each of these, but we've now uh, shrunk them by this droplet shrink size. We shrunk them and then we map them onto, we drizzle them onto a grid that has twice as many pixels in it. And so this one, this one for instance, gets divided among these two new pixels. This one gets divided among these two and this one among these two. Now, if you look at the white border here, this is our next white border. We have dithered our image. We've pushed the image over, and now this, the pixels are offset compared to the original drizzle image. This is the drizzle image. So now this one maps into three images, three pixels. It gives a portion, a big portion to the center one, and this one here, it gets a little bit of that of that uh, signal in it from, from there to there is added into this pixel, and from there to there is added into this pixel. And now we see we're starting to get some uh, definition at a higher frequency than what we had here. 
uh, or here. And that's what drizzling is doing for us. It's just mapping these pixels into new pixels uh, with different intensities than they started with. I'm not going to follow through with this because I'd have had to have 15 sets of these before we got our stars back. Okay, so what are you going to do with your drizzle image? This is important because whether you spend your time drizzling or not depends on what you're going to do with it, at least in my opinion. Drizzle is useful if you're going to do the following thing. Use it for a detailed visual or scientific analysis, something down at the pixel level. We're going to analyze your images. You're going to make 300 dot per inch uh, prints and frame them and uh, have your viewers look at them up close, maybe with a, micro with a uh, hand lens. Uh, if you're going to greatly enlarge a small piece of your image, and uh, maybe like the planet Neptune on your image and look for detail on Neptune, then it would be valuable. This is all assuming that you've met the criteria to dither, that then you could do those things with it. Drizzle is not going to be useful if you're going to show your images on a computer screen. There's not enough resolution on the computer screen to show much. Uh, if you're going to share it in email or on, the, on a newsletter, uh, probably not worth drizzling. Yeah, you could do the same thing here. You could greatly enlarge your image and show that. But just for showing whole images, definitely not, uh, not viable for a computer screen or an internet or newsletter. And if you're going to save the image as a JPEG or other lossy format, uh, you're going to lose far more information saving it in JPEG than you gained by dithering it. So don't do that. Oops. Well, I can't get to the next slide. Okay. Uh, a little bit of history, just, at the, just so you know where we sit on this. In the past, we actually used to do what's called super resolution by using uh, Fourier, two-dimensional Fourier analyses on the batches of images. I actually worked on some of this for a different, totally different purpose, for seismic exploration for oil. Uh, back in the 1980s, I did it. So the super resolution idea has been around. It works, the Fourier method works uh, well too. It's just a different way of doing it. At present, the, the Vogue thing to do is drizzle, but in fact, People are still publishing research articles on better ways to do it with Fourier analysis. Uh, in the future, there's already programs out there that use artificial intelligence methods to uh, drizzle or to enhance super resolution. Unfortunately, none of them are in a form that are readily usable by an end user. They're all just uh, subroutines of, of code that you have to uh, input to a a program that understands what it is you're trying to do with artificial intelligence. And not many of us have those. So, may all your drizzles be of the good kind. And uh, that's all I have to say about drizzling. Uh, I was kind of rushed, but I hope you got the general feel for, for it. And don't just run out and drizzle because you have more than one thing. Be happy to answer any questions you have or uh, whatever. Uh, Alex, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed on uh, auto stackers, uh, I have it up here on another screen. Um, auto stackers has uh, under what they call advanced settings, uh, drizzle of off 1.5 and 3.0x. So. <clears throat> Evidently, it's not variable. Uh, it's one of those two fixed levels uh, that you have to select from. Uh, the uh, the but underneath that it says resample 2.0x. Could you explain maybe what they're meaning by resample? Is is that another form of drizzle or what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, I have never used auto stacker, so I'm, I'm not sure what their terminology for that is. Uh, it is interesting that they use 1.5 and 3, and PixInsight uses 2 and 4, and you don't get to make your own choice in there, at least not yet. Uh, 
you know, I, I don't know what resampling is. My guess is they downsample the image somehow before they, they, uh, they drizzle it. I, I, I don't know what that, why they would do that. Or, I've not used it, sorry. Uh, quite right. I was just uh, kind of curious if yeah. someone knew. Maybe, maybe it just needs to be played with. Uh, Greg, have you ever played with that? Uh, yeah, I, I used uh, 1.5 drizzle on almost all my planetary images. And I'm kind of surprised because um, according to the criterion that Alex described there, it wouldn't, doesn't seem that um, uh, some, a lot of those criteria are met, but the, the drizzle seems to do a pretty nice job on uh, planetary images where, you know, you have a, a pretty fine detail, so. I'll have to go back and look at the software more carefully now to, to see why it's doing what it's doing. One thing that happens with drizzling is it tends to smooth the data. Uh, and so a lot of times it looks better because of this, what I said, it takes the noise in the pixels and spreads them over several pixels. And it makes the image look clearer and, uh, and with more resolution where all it's done is suppress the visual impact of the noise. And so you have to be aware of that. Now, like I said, it also depends to some degree on how many images you have, because if you have to be able to cover the, the uh, all of those new pixels with a goodly sample of data, every pixel in your original image has to map into the pixels so that each pixel doesn't have just one sample from the original images, but has dozens of samples from the original image. Um, it's a complex thing. And I think that the breakthrough is going to be when the AI stuff gets incorporated into the programs we can access. Uh, I believe that's going to be a major, a major change of, of things, but it won't change things. If, it, if the information isn't in the original image, you can't put it there. <laughs> so. Oh, Alex, I have a question. Um, uh -huh. maybe. Uh, from your calculations and your examples, uh, it, it seems that <clears throat> almost any kind of telescope or optic from a telephoto lens up to maybe a six or eight inch scope, combined with most kinds of cameras available today for amateur use, as well as maybe maybe what, two arc seconds roughly seen yeah. on average. It looks like drizzle would be beneficial for all of that, right? No, um, <laughs> only, well, yes and no. If you're using, a, it's all about the pixel size. As you get longer and longer focal length, uh, you need uh, bigger and bigger pixels for, in order to make drizzle useful. For most of our scopes uh, with two arc second, Let's say, let's say you have a six inch scope, or maybe you have a Takahashi 150. So with a six inch scope and scene of one arc second, I'm right, and, and I'm right at the limit with, a, with a, a scope that has, I'm trying to think of the pixel size. Uh, well, with a high end camera, it, it, I'm right at the, right at the limit of being able to benefit from drizzle. And normally I don't do it because I don't want to spend the time on it. And, and for when I get done with it, it doesn't look any different to me than before I drizzle it, unless yeah. I zoom way into the pixel level. So really it could be your computing system, memory, RAM, all that, and processing time, et cetera, transference to other software and things like that. Those considerations might be more impactful than, than a lot of others. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, yeah, there are ways to spend your time other than that. But I will say one thing, if you, if you want to use Drizzle, remember the old game, and I don't know whether anybody plays it anymore, where we used to uh, take our, our subs, when we did L, the luminance sub, we do it at full CCD resolution, and then our RGB, we do two by two binning, well, if you, if you 
played the same game with uh, drizzle. You could drizzle your L frames, your luminance frames, and then use your RGB as, as if they were two by two binned and expand them in your, in your image integration to uh, the size of the drizzle L. Because in fact, there's, your eye picks up very little in the way of resolution information from R, G, and B. 99% of what you see is sharpness and detail is in the L channel. And so don't spend your time dithering the RGB, just dither the L if you, if you must. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I have a, uh, a question slash comment. Um, you know, I have a one-shot color camera, and I, I like your uh, briefing, by the way. It's a very good briefing and definitely food for thought. I want to go back over that um, in more depth. But I noticed uh, when, when you were talking about the drizzling that I remember a conversation on a post from Juan Canero of Pix Insight about when you should and when you shouldn't mm -hmm. use drizzle. And he specifically says that you should always use drizzle um, for one shot color and for color mosaic images. Um, and I think that there, I think folks can go out and Google for that uh, on the Pix Insight forums, but uh, just uh, interesting that your perspective is a little different. I like your analysis, so I can't challenge it that way, but uh, Juan's a pretty sharp guy and uh, I take his, you know, his advice with, uh, you know, some authority. I think the, the key there is that a, a one-shot color camera is a different beast. Uh, when you, because of the uh, Bayer pattern in your, in your camera, in your uh, CCD, the, for instance, one red frame, one red value actually gets sampled by many pixels around it. And so your resolution, your effective pixel size is not the actual pixel size in the camera. It's at least four times that large or yeah, four times that large and could even be larger because this information is shared in order to make a RGB pixel. It samples lots of, of an R pixel here, a G pixel here, a B. And so uh, they're all combined into this one color pixel. And so the pixel size is larger. So I would think that uh, particularly in CCD cameras, drizzling would probably be useful in most color one shot one shot color cameras now when we go, we're going now you know i don't know whether everybody's familiar with it but basically some of these big chip makers have already gotten out of the business and the other are getting out of the ccd business uh, i'm not sure I'll, I'll say this and then i'll qualify it i believe um I was going to say Kodak, but I don't think it is. Uh, one of the, the big, big suppliers of, of chips is going to stop in three years making CCD chips, and they're going entirely to CMOS. And what's driving this is our uh, cell phones. That's where the money is, putting cameras and cell phones, not putting cameras on telescopes. So uh, we're all going to be using these things, and the size of the pixels there is very small. It's, uh, I've got a telescope on order with a pixel size of an, and 1.4 micron pixels in it. And so when we're down to that level, drizzling is going to be a thing of the past for all of us, regardless of what kind of camera you have. At least if we're doing it on Earth. If we can get our telescopes into space somehow, <laughs> then that's a different story. Okay, well, that was a, a great presentation, and I'll try to make sure I get a copy of Alex's slides to put up uh, okay. so that you can go through and digest uh, some of those uh, longer equations later. Um, but I think, you know, uh, it's, it's a uh, good food for thought to go back and look at the math behind some of the stuff that we're doing. Uh, the second part of our program tonight, Tom and I thought it would be interesting just to kind of uh, 
go back and forth and share a few um, uh, possible targets to suggest for you guys uh, for this month of November. So uh, Tom's going to start us off, and then I'll we'll go back and forth for a couple of these targets. To hopefully, give you some ideas of things that you might want to try shooting for. So Tom, you want to take it? Yeah, I'll start. Let me share my screen. So, I have um, some images to share. This is a recent uh, picture that I took of NGC 6992. It's the, I think this is the, the West Vale Nebula. Correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it's the East one. I get them mixed up. <laughs> but uh, it's in Cygnus and um, we can show you a little bit of where it's at. I'll move that over here. Okay. So then we'll. Okay, you can see Cygnus. Can everybody see my screen? Looks fine. All right, thank you. So you can see Cygnus here. And 6992 is just up in this area. Um, to, oh, I call it the wing of the, of the goose, if you will. But uh, and six nine nine zero, which is also part. So the nine nine two is the east. Nine nine zero is the west veil nebula. So those are really nice objects right now. You can see that this is the current time is is seven forty three, and if we look, we're pretty high in the sky. It's almost almost straight up so there's a lot less atmosphere to go through and um, it, 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 it comes out really pretty nice this object was um, first discovered in September of 1784 by William Herschel and is a supernova a supernova remnant and they believe it exploded between 5,000 or 8,000 years ago and it's roughly 1,900 light years away and about 100 light years across. So, um, and this image was taken, we'll go back to the image. This image was taken with a Celestron C8 a star zone of 0.7 focal reducer um, on a AVX mount using a ZWO 294MC Pro as the main camera, using a ZWO 290MC uh, attached to a Orion Short Tube 80 as a guide camera. So I'm going to pass it back to Greg now. Okay, Greg, your turn. Okay. Hello, 
I'm going to, um, uh, can everybody see my screen here, wide field image? Yes. Okay. Um, the first uh, target I'm going to point out to you uh, is actually a whole bunch of different targets, but if you want to take picture images of uh, open clusters, uh, Cassiopeia is the place to go. And Cassiopeia is uh, rising in the east after dark now. So again, uh, this is uh, around 8 p.m. Uh, if you went out and looked to the north this evening, uh, it'd be in this general area here where Cassiopeia is. And where we're interested in is the target area around NGC 663, which is one of the uh, larger um, open clusters uh, in uh, Cassiopeia. And you, you can see on the map here, there's quite a few different ones, but we're going to concentrate on this area right here because uh, you have the ability with a, a wide angle scope to, uh, to capture more than one of these open clusters in the same field. So here's a, um, a blow up of that area. Uh, and this is, uh, the outline here is what you would expect to uh, capture if you had a full frame DSLR or a full frame CCD camera or a full frame CMOS camera and a 900 millimeter focal length telescope. So you can see that uh, NGC 663 is a rather large uh, uh, open cluster here in the middle, uh, but there uh, is uh, NG another NGC object up here, uh, IC 166 over here, Burke uh, 6 over here, uh, NGC 659 down here, Trumpler uh, 1 over here, and Cernic 4. Uh, all these open clusters can all be captured, you know, with a moderate size uh, telescope and a, and a full frame camera. And of course, if you have something with, with smaller, you could uh, compose uh, any combination of these objects. So this is the uh, an image taken with my full frame camera. And you can see here are the uh, objects that I pointed out before, and here they are labeled. Um, uh, again, NGC 663 is kind of the showpiece here, but the other ones are, uh, are pretty nice as well. And in fact, there's a small reflection nebula, Vandenberg 6, that's uh, kind of attached to NGC 654. So this is a, a, a great field to explore if you've got a a wide field setup uh, with the telescope and camera. Okay, I'm gonna to toss it back to Tom and he's gonna share his next target. Nice image, Greg. <laughs> I like that one. So we're gonna share screen again. All right, we'll um, put this one away. And we'll pull up Starry Night. And we're going to go to NGC 7293. And this is often referred to as the uh, Helix Nebula or the Eye of God. And uh, it's a planetary nebula. nebula. Um, again, it's a, a large planetary nebula in the, in the constellation Aquarius. Um, it was discovered around 1824 by Carl Ludwig. Uh, it has a magnitude of 7.3 and it's roughly 650 light years away. It's estimated to be somewhere around 10,600 years old, and it's expanding pretty rapidly, 31 kilometers per second. It is uh, currently 2.5 light years across, and again, this was taken with a Celestron AVX, um, short two baby, low star camera for the guiding, a ZWO 294MC Pro camera and uh, a 6.3 focal reducer that uh, I had a Celestron focal reducer. So and Tom, uh, we didn't see that picture. There's the image. Ah, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. 
I thought it'd be best to show you where it's at first. So um, I really enjoy this image. I want to try it again because there's a, you can see up here, there's some nebulosity that's, they, they call it the, the uh, eyebrow of the eye. So I want to see if I can get a little more detail. But uh, I was really very happy with this particular image. Okay, Greg, back to you. Okay, do you see my screen again? Not yet. Okay. How about now? Yes. Okay. So the the previous uh, target that I uh, picked out was uh, for wide field scope um, with a lot of different targets contained in it. Uh, this one, this image is um, probably for a longer focal length, um, something on the order of 2,000 to 3,000 milliliters, uh, millimeters, and um, uh, this is uh, M76 um, in Persis, uh, sometimes called the little dumbbell, sometimes called the Clark Nebula because of its shape. Uh, and in any case, if you, um, it's right on the border between Persis and, and uh, Andromeda. So it, the, the two stars that will help you find it are uh, 51 Andromeda and then Phi Percy uh, and the the little dumbbell M76 is located just to the north of that. So <clears throat> again, this is a, a simulated uh, field of view of the, uh, uh, this would be uh, if you had an STF 8300 type uh, CCD, uh, which is, uh, in case you've forgotten, about 18 by 13.5 millimeter size chip. So it's uh, uh, not, not quite as big as an APC, APS type chip, but almost. And a moderate length uh, scope, around 1,200 millimeters or so. Uh, and this would be the, the field of view around the uh, Clark Nebula M76. So again, here is the uh, image that goes along with those uh, settings. This is probably a little bit wider field than the one I showed you before. But you can see it's a small, uh, but bright planetary nebula um, with um, some uh, interesting detail. Uh, and it's even better if you uh, blow it up a little bit. Um, and you can see that there's uh, quite a bit of detail here. Uh, this is just an LRGB. Um, you could probably get a, a bit more detail with by adding in some narrow band filters. Uh, but this is a, a good target for a, a medium to longer length a uh, telescope uh, with an appropriate camera hooked up to it. So that's my uh, second target. And I'm going to hand it back to Tom for one more target. Okay, we'll uh, start the screen sharing again. And we'll put this image away. And We'll go back to Starry Night Pro and we'll type in M33. And most of you have probably taken pictures of this galaxy. Um, it is in the constellation. I got to read my notes here. Anyway, <laughs> you can see it's fairly close to Taurus. Um, and Mars is not too far off. So you could use the star Murek, a double star, to get a little bit north and 
west of it and come down um, a little ways. I'm not sure exactly how much. I guess the uh, disadvantage using a go-to scope is that it knows where it's at. But um, I did try to see this one time uh, through a C11 and I could get a faint fuzzy blob. But um, this is this particular galaxy is uh, often called the triangulum or the pinwheel. It was discovered, believed to be discovered by G Giovanni Battista Hadinera before 1654, so quite some time ago. And it was rediscovered by Messier in 1764. It's approximately 2.9 million light years away, and it's approximately 60,000 light years across. It also belongs to our group of galaxy, uh, Andromeda, the Milky Way, and M33. Again, this image was taken with the AVX mount, the short tube 80, a Lodestar guide camera, a Celestron 6.3 focal reducer, and the ZWO, uh, 294 MC Pro, and here's the image. So, any questions on any of the things that I've presented? Okay. Back to you, Greg. Okay, well, thanks. That should give you some uh, uh, food for thought for things to, uh, to look for. So if, if you were paying attention, you notice that Tom pointed to one object in the western sky, one object in the southern sky, and one object that's kind of in the eastern sky. And both the objects I pointed to were kind of in the northern sky. So you really have your choice there, depending on where the trees are in your yard as to what you might want to uh, go look for. Um, that's pretty much what we have for tonight. If there are uh, anybody that uh, wants to share an image, uh, if you have an image that you have a question about or just want to show folks what you've been up to, uh, please feel free to speak up, share your screen. Hey, Greg, I'll throw one up, but it'll be a deja vu moment. Okay. Today. The helix again. Can anybody see that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, if you recall, a couple months ago, I was fretting over the decision of what, what new CMOS camera to get. I ended up getting the 533, which has pretty small sensor and pretty small pixels. Um, Kevin, and I, I can't I see really the image. Something with a wider view. I don't see it either. Um, are you guys seeing it? No. Not yet. No. Not yet. No. I don't here. I'm getting share screen. There we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> any, anyhow, so the, you know, part of my thought process was this would let me go after smaller targets, though this is anything but a small planetary. <laughs> um, and a couple of people raised the concern of what the square format looks like. So anyhow, this was from CAC a couple weekends ago, and I thought I'd throw it up there. Um, fairly happy with it so far. Still, still learning ins and outs, but otherwise it seems pretty efficient, pretty low noise. Uh, what was the exposure length on that? That is 36 five minute exposures. Very nice. It is very nice. So, in share. How do I end the share? Up near the top of the screen, there sh should be a thing that allows you to sh shut off sharing. You no, know, I found it before, but I'm not seeing it now. It's usually in red. I can end the whole meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me just close Lightroom.
Nope. Hey, Kevin, in the middle of the, of the screen at the top, you have the big green bar, and then you've got the red right next to it. Stop share. Oh, I know why I'm not seeing it. Because I've got a little uh, spring clip holding the webcam up there. <laughs> my view. Thank you. All right. Anybody I else? I owe you, Doug. Okay. So actually, um, I wanted to make a comment, uh, Greg, about your, your comments on uh, M76. And I'll share, if you don't mind, I'll share a, uh, a fast focal length picture of that, right? F22. Okay. Uh, let me grab that real quick. Can you see this image? Yes. yes. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's not got the greatest detail in it, but it's, uh, it's not horrible. That's fast, uh, F22 for that object. So I, I concur with your statement, by the way, that generally speaking, longer focal length for those small planetaries. But we don't want to totally discourage folks from, from trying that, yeah? Um, and while I'm here, maybe I'll, I'll, sorry, while I'm here, I'll steal just a couple more seconds and show a couple of things. I was out with Kevin at CAC here uh, and uh, was taking a few low elevation targets. And so um, I've got a nice shot that kind of surprised me of, of NGC 55 here that, um, you know, nice bright object low in the sky, uh, you know, 19 degree elevation. This is 14 minutes at F22. Um, but uh, there's some detail there, so I was uh, reasonably happy with that. And I'll show uh, an object I've never tried before, which um, and I've never seen it before, uh, the Jellyfish Nebula, which um, doesn't look anything like a jellyfish. But uh, in any case, I like the I like the detail on the left side. I was kind of surprised that uh, it's fairly bright if you get enough data, and uh, that object. Um, that's uh, 23 minutes at F22. F22 so, on what size scope? Uh, uh, 11 inch, 11 uh, inch. Rasa 11. Yeah. So, but it actually turned out pretty well. I'm reasonably happy with that. And what camera? Uh, that's uh, ASI 183. Um, so that's a 1.9 micron pixel. Um, the plate scale for that combo is uh, 0.7 and I do drizzle, so uh, it doesn't matter in this case. I'm not, you know, the seeing is not going to give me that. But, um, but in any case, yeah, that's 0.7 uh, arc seconds per pixel. Great image. Yeah, it, it turned out pretty nice. Very nice. All right, I'll let go. Hey, Doug, if you rotate 90 degrees clockwise, you'll get the jellyfish effect. Uh, I, I thought maybe the jellyfish was sort of you know, the left-hand side of this picture and maybe ignoring kind of the bottom right. Uh, th then it looks a little bit like a jellyfish, you know, turn 90 degrees, like you say. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, but with the whole nebula in there, it looks more like a brain or something. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> <a bizarre object. laughs> All right, I'll let go. All right, very good. I can, I can put one up for you if you don't mind hearing from me again. Sure. Oh, yeah, Alex. that come up? Oh. Yep. Very nice. Well, that's the tarantula nebula taken from Chile on a scope I lease time on. <clears throat> now, this one has not been drizzled, even though it's, it's from that TAO 150 that I said is just on borderline for drizzling. But you should, certainly can see a lot of detail in here. Now, I've removed the stars. That's one thing. The um, uh, and there was, this was taken over a couple of years with two different cameras on the same scope. They trashed the first camera. It was having some problems, but I took the images from that and from a later camera, put them together, and I had 40 hours of exposure time uh, covering narrow band and broadband. Then, as I said, I took out the stars <clears throat> and did something a little different here. Uh, I estimated the uh, hydrogen line emissions only, not the background red. So I extracted the, the line, subtracted the, an estimate of the background, and put the, the line intensities 
into the L channel, into the luminous channel. And that's what you see here. Is this, so this is the structure in the hydrogen alpha emission uh, of the nebula with the RGB from, uh, from RGB, as well as from hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And it zoomed it way the hell in, as you can tell. Uh, but I really was amazed to see the amount of detail that you could get uh, by using the hydrogen line. That's about all I ha have for today. Very nice. Thanks, Alex. Excellent. Uh, cool. Thank you. All right. Any others? We had, uh, oh. I'm, I'm very impressed. The, uh, uh, the caliber of the images that you guys are producing are, are really good, and I encourage you to uh, keep sharing them as much as possible. Uh, I have one there, uh, Craig. Okay. Um, you probably saw it already. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, well, I bought a, I got a, a Rokinon, uh, 135 millimeter f2 lens, and uh, testing it out. So I piggybacked it a couple, well, about a week ago or so. Um, so this is the Central Orion region. Um, this was a 53 minute or 53 times one minute exposures, total of 53 minutes at F2. Um, let's see if I can, I don't know if I can zoom in. Well, I guess I can't zoom in or anything like that. Um, I don't think. You got Bernard's loop completely there, it looks like. That's nice. That's, that was the first thing I noticed. <laughs> yeah, Bernard's loop and a bunch of nebulosity. It's a little tricky here, maneuvering. <laughs> it's impossible. Anyway, you see bits and pieces of the image, so it worked out pretty well. So it's now, a nice sharp us, lens. I was surprised that. Tell us really, again what lens this is. It's uh, the one I have is actually called a Samyang. It's made by Rokinon. It's a 135 millimeter f2, and this was shot wide open at f2, which surprised me because if you you know this is a full frame image on a Nikon uh, DA10A camera, so it's full 36, 35 millimeter frame size, and even down in the corners, you know it's it's quite sharp. Yeah, it's pretty good. Most times nice. give you a pretty bloopy stars out in the corners but uh it was amazing that you caught as much of the uh, red nebulosity as you did i mean you could we'd expect you to catch the stuff around the m42 and the horse head but the, you know the really faint stuff the barnard's loop it's pretty amazing yeah it brought it out i noticed when i processed it i didn't want to concentrate too much on red but a lot of the nebulosity seems to have a pretty strong yellow component to it. So when I brought that out a little bit, it really brought this um, fainter material, you know, out in the uh, environs around M42 out pretty well, as opposed to just red. Like over by the horse head, it's quite a bit noticeably more reddish, yeah. more dusky and yellow in, in the fainter areas. So. It was a little tricky processing it. This was taken actually over two nights. The first night was just a 15 times one minute run, and then the, it worked out pretty well. So I added 38 more exposures the next night and compiled them in Photoshop. So, anyway, it's a great lens. I think you ought to check it out if you're interested in doing telephoto work. It's the nicest result I've got from any telephoto lens. So. Stop. There you go. Excellent. Very nice. All right. Well, um, we're still always gotta... looking for uh, uh, topics for future meetings. So again, um, if you have uh, something that you'd like to present or that uh, you'd like to hear somebody else talk about, um, you can send that to Tom or to me, and we'll try to do our best to uh, 
find somebody to to address the topic. Um, and again, uh, thank Alex for uh, spending time getting all the information together that he did for his fine presentation on drizzling. By the way, if anybody has questions, uh, you can email them to me. Um, any, Greg, you're free to share my email with any members. And, okay. And uh, just send them to me, and maybe I can answer them, maybe I can't. Maybe I can point you to someone who can. Thank you. All right. I just have a, I just have a quick question for Tom Ebby. What, okay. what, was the, what was the camera that you used? What, what hookup? Would you hook up to it for that? <laughs> Uh, that the camera was a Nikon D eight ten A. Oh, okay. Their Astro camera. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I'll uh, try to post the slides in the recording as soon as I can get that all together. So, Alex, if you send me your slide presentation, I'll have that. I will do that. Okay. Probably tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. See you next month. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.